بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كلامه المجيد والفرقان الحميد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون صدق الله العلي العظيم I begin in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship except the one Allah and that his beloved Nabi and Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, is his last and final messenger. It gives me a great pleasure and honor to be here with all of you, although virtually uh, I greet you uh, with assalamu alaikum once again. Uh, from Zaytuna College, live from Berkeley, California, uh, where we bring to you the first of many live sessions that will help us prepare uh, for the month of Ramadan, inshallah. So today, inshallah, we plan to go through the, uh, the fiqh of fasting according to the Hanafi fiqh. We'll be using the Ascent to Felicity text for the most part, inshallah. And then we will open it up to your questions. Uh, and so we hope, inshallah, that towards the end of our session, we'll be able to answer uh, people's questions as well. And so I welcome you as we go through this. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to type them out. And inshallah, we'll be able to, uh, you know, uh, with, with, uh, time willing, we'll be able to uh, go through them, inshallah. So wherever you are in the world, um, right here in California, United States, or anywhere in the world, we uh, thank you all for uh, for joining us, inshallah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. As we all know, uh, Ramadan happens to be a, a very special time. Uh, it's a time of joy. It's a time of uh, ibadah and worship. It's a time of proximity to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's a time for us to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there are certain actions that we are required to do in the month of Ramadan, right? Certain things that we're required to do and specifically we have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the month of Ramadan as a gift yet at the same time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says there are certain things that you are required to do that you should do in the month of Ramadan that will make your month, that will make this month far more meritorious, far more filled with blessings. And of course, uh, as we all know, and it's not foreign to us, fasting happens to be the biggest thing that we do uh, in addition to everything else. Uh, and then of course, we also um, pray our Salatul Taraweeh, two specific actions. And then of course, all other acts of ibadah and worship such as increase in the recitation of Qur'an, uh, increase in our generosity. Uh, many people choose to pay zakah as well, which is why inshallah, one week from now, uh, next Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are completely dedicated to the fiqh of zakah right here from uh, Zaytuna College, inshallah. So I recited a verse of the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum as siyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Right, fasting has been made an obligation upon you just as it was made for the people before you. And the reason why you fast is to attain taqwa so that you may be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, cognizant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, and that's what Allah so this, this fasting is not specifically, was not Muslims. Uh, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam and his sahaba, they weren't the first ones to receive this. There were previous ummas that had some sort of fasting in some way, shape or form, slightly different. But there's a very specific method that was prescribed to the believers. And for the last 1400 years, Muslims, wherever they are, as long as they did not have uh, an excuse, they fasted. And they found it... Uh, a joy to fast. They found it a privilege to fast. They looked forward to fasting. Right? That's it's very interesting how, you know, um, people will say not even water, and you know, as Muslims we respond and say not even water. But the interesting thing is that 
as we approach the month of Ramadan as Muslims, we look forward to it. Despite having to fast all day and refraining from eating and drinking, it's not burdensome. It's, it's, it, we feel privileged, we feel honored, we feel excited. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum as Fasting was made an obligation unto you as it was made upon the people before you so that we would attain taqwa. And so the goal of this entire month happens to be proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As there's a narration that goes, Kun ma'allah tarallah ma'ak. Be with Allah and you will find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with you. And then in the verse after, and we won't go through all the verses, in the verse after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ayyama ma'dudat. It's a specific, a fixed number of days. In other words, Allah out of His mercy does not want us to fast all year, does not want to burden us. It's a fixed number of days. It's either 29 or 30 days and we... Uh, we complete fasting on those days. In the verse after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. It's the month in which the Qur'an was revealed. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically chose the month of Ramadan to reveal the Qur'an. As a result of which, the Qur'an and Ramadan have a beautiful relationship with each other. People who may not recite the Qur'an regularly, will definitely recite it in Ramadan. People who recite it regularly will increase in their recitation. People who have a hard time reciting the Qur'an will work even harder. In fact, just a few days ago, you know, I saw, um, you know, there was an online class somewhere of, um, you know, five or six days, some intensive class where you know uh, people uh, people who were not fluent in their recitation would come together just so that they could get a refresher so that the month during the month of Ramadan they can increase their recitation of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and i'm going to come to this later Ramadan is specific not only for the reflection of the Quran but it's very specific to the recitation of the Quran right our elders when we when we there's a book called the, the Ramadan of the elders we find that these were people who would recite large amounts of these were people who were fluent no doubt but they would recite large portions of the quran daily in fact they would spend so it's not about how much they would recite although they would recite a lot but these were people who were spending four to five hours daily reciting the quran so while someone who may not be fluent in their recitation of the quran we the question we ask ourselves is how much time it's not about how much you recite it's about how much time we spend with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, as far as, you know, when we look at the hadith traditions of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find many, many a hadith in regards to fasting where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes on to mention, and I'll share two a hadith with you. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever fasts during the month of Ramadan with faith, man sama ramadana imanan, wahti saban, and seeking the reward with Allah. Who else do we seek reward from? Right? Who else do we seek reward? We seek our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive their past sins. One of the central themes of the month of Ramadan is forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, whoever prays during the nights in Ramadan with faith, iman and wahtisaban, and seeks the reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have their past sins forgiven. And the one who passes the night of Qadr in prayer with faith and seeking the reward from Allah will have their past sins forgiven. In another narration, again, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu narrates and he says, if anyone omits, does not fast even for a day in Ramadan without any concession or without being ill. In other words, of course, if a person is ill and they cannot fast, they're not required to fast. If a person is on a journey and there's difficulty, they're not required to fast. There's a number of reasons uh, for which we don't have to fast in the month of Ramadan. And you know, some people will pay a fidya and others would make up the fasting. Then, but if someone had no excuse whatsoever and chose not to fast, the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says, then if that individual were to fast for the rest of their life, they could not make up for that one fast. Could not make up for that one fast because there's a certain barakah, there's a certain blessing. 
of the fast of the month of Ramadan. That's why, you know, we've seen, and again, this is not a general rule, just sharing, uh, you know, we've seen some of our, uh, you know, elders and teachers that if they weren't very sick, they would still choose to fast. If they were on a journey in which they could manage their fasting, they would still continue to fast. But rightfully, the same teachers and elders, if they got older and they just weren't able to fast at all as a result of uh, their health not allowing th them to do so, then of course they would not fast. So it's not, no one should feel guilty about not fasting in Ramadan if one has a reason or um, you know an excuse to not not fast. So keep that in mind and I'll close with this one hadith and continue. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu relates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, many people who fast get nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst. And many people who pray at night get nothing from it except simply staying awake. In other words, while there are, we have to follow certain rules in order for us to get the maximum not only maximum reward from Allah, but the maximum benefit from our ibadah, right? We, what, we, what we sometimes fail to realize that the ibadah and worship that we do, it comes with a reward, no doubt, but it also comes with benefits, right? benefits unseen, right? Benefits unseen. And when we do that act of ibadah completely, perfectly, then not only are, are we fulfilling an obligation, and not only are we receiving a reward from Allah, but we are also receiving this barakah and blessings in our lives that open up the doors of Allah's mercy, remove the difficulties and worries from our path. Ramadan happens to be uh, Allah's gift to mankind uh, Allah wanted to give us a specific time in the year in which we would dedicate ourselves to ibadah and worship. And Allah knows that we want to worship Him. We enjoy worshiping Him. But there's this creation of Allah called shaitan that sometimes and many times makes it so difficult for us to do so. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I love my slaves so much that I'm going to lock up the shaitan so that it becomes easy for you to make ibadah and worship. Ramadan was made an obligation in the second year of hijrah and Ibn Hajar Asqalani rahmatullahi alayh narrates that the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam fasted for nine Ramadans before he passed away. And of course, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would also make i'tikaf, and we will come to i'tikaf in a few moments. Why do we fast? We fast because Allah wants us to do so. And I will do whatever my Lord wants me to do. I will do whatever my Lord wants me to do. I will submit to Him so that I can please my Lord and my Creator. But at the same time, a few worldly reasons for which we fast makes us appreciate and gives, give thanks for the pleasures that we have, makes us give up things that are haram, that, are, that we shouldn't be doing, things that are not desirable, helps us in controlling our desires, allows us to feel compassion and empathy towards others, allows us to train ourselves, right? Train ourselves. What we, what the biggest, one of the biggest benefits of the month of Ramadan is that we know we can do good. We know we can refrain from evil. We're, we have the ability and we, all we need to do is after Ramadan, just continue that, right? Just continue that. And as long as we can continue that, we're in good shape. And sometimes when it becomes a little difficult for us, we get that reminder once again. Ramadan comes right back around. Ramadan is a blessing in, in so many ways and it gets us used to doing a great deal of ibadah and worship. Now to move on to the fiqh of fasting. Uh, fiqh in and of itself, um, if, if you haven't formally studied fiqh, um, it can be a little dry. Uh, it can be a little uh, you know, tiresome. 
a uh, lot of details, though the text that we are using um, is called Maraqiyu Sa'dat. It's a very simple uh, text, very beautifully translated by Sheikh Faraz Khan, who is on our uh, esteemed faculty, one of my uh, colleagues here uh, at Zaytuna College. And so we'll be using his, uh, his text, inshallah, for the most part uh, to go through Kitab al Salm and the Book of Fasting. What is, so technically, according to Islamic law, Sharia, what is defined as fasting, right? What is a psalm? A psalm is to withhold uh, from eating, from drinking, from intercourse, right? Sexual intercourse uh, during the daylight hours. Now, we will define in a moment what daylight hours is from true dawn, subah, sadiq, until sunset, right? That's daylight hours. With the intention of fasting, the niyyah has to be there. In other words, if someone does not make the niyyah and simply remains hungry all day, it technically won't be considered to be fasting and technically there's no reward for this person staying hungry, whether it's an ob obligatory fast or a non-obligatory fast, whether it is a sunnah fast or a voluntary fast, the intention must be there. There are specific times for the intentions. We'll come to that in a moment as well. So to withhold from eating, drinking, intercourse during daylight hours with the intention of fasting performed by one who is capable of doing so. Right? Capable and required to do so. Children are not required to fast. Ill people are not required to fast. The very elderly are not required to fast. The pregnant are not required to fast. Right? So for one who is required to fast and also is capable to fast, there may be many who are not able to fast for a number of reasons. And if that happens to be the case, and I want to share this really quickly here, something that came to my mind. If there is anyone who, for whatever reason, is unable to fast, they should not feel guilty. They should not feel bad. They should not feel sad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put you in this place and in this position out of His divine wisdom. And one of the gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you is that you are unable to fast. Despite your desire to fast, had you been able to do so. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards you, rewards those individuals for fasting, inshallah, even without having fasted, right? Without having fasted. And it's a reminder to the rest of us that we, when we see someone or meet someone or become aware of someone who is unable to fast, not look down at them because, you know, it's not like these people chose to not fast. There are people who have certain, um, you know, uh, scenarios uh, as a result of which they are unable to fast. Now, as far as fasting, we won't be covering all of them, but as far as fasting, uh, the action of fasting and how it is uh, categorized, there are seven types of fast. There's the fard, which is obligatory, wajib, which is mandatory. There's the sunnah. There's the mandub, which is recommended. There's the nafal, which is voluntary. There's the makruh tahrim, which is prohibitively disliked. And then makruh tanzih, which is mildly disliked, right? So fasting, there's literally seven types of fast. And just really quickly, I may go over them. Uh, so as far as the first category, the, 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 fa the, the fasts that are obligatory, fard, the fasting of Ramadan, Right? The fasting of Ramadan, ada'an wa qada'an. Whether you fast on time in Ramadan or you're making them up later on after Ramadan, even if you're making them up, that falls within the obligatory category. The fasts of expiation, kafara, are an obligation. I'm going to come to this later as well. Vowed fast, manzur, if someone made a nazar, if someone made a vow, in Urdu you call it nazar, Mannat, uh, we also use that word. Uh, if someone vowed to fast an X amount of days as a result of you know something that they wanted with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, that is also considered to be um, uh, an obligatory. Uh, now, some will say it's wajib, but for the most part, it falls into the category of a uh, obligatory fast. A wajib, 
uh, is the makeup of a broken voluntary fast. So if, if you began in the Hanafi school, if you began a voluntary fast, you woke up one fine day and it was a Monday and you said, you know, I, I want to fast today or fast tomorrow, whatever the case may be. And you began your fast. And that afternoon, you know, you came across a friend. Someone said, hey, let's go for lunch. Uh, because it's a voluntary fast, you can break your fast. In fact, some would say that if you have been invited, you should break your fast. Um, but... Uh, once you have broken that fast in the Hanafi school, you are required. It is wajib now for you to make it up because you began an act of ibadah and because you began it, it now becomes a wajib for you to uh, finish it. The sunnah fasts, um, as the book mentions, the, the, the fasting of Ashura along with a day before or after, right? Sumu qablahu yawma aw ba'dahu yawma, the 10th of Muharram. The recommended fasts are the fasting of three days every month, Mondays and Thursdays, or the six fasts of Shawwal. Some would even say that that category is from the Sunnah as well. Um, now, the, some ulama drop it in the mandub, recommended category because it's not something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did all the time and so they say yes it is a sunnah but it's not the same category of a sunnah where you know there's uh, where the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam did it diligently so it falls into the category of a mandub uh, a voluntary fast uh, would be any other fast you know any other day that you would fast would become a voluntary fast makruh tahreem uh, would be uh, the two days of Eid along with the Ayyam al-Tashriq, right? The Eid al-Fitr, Eid al-Adha, and then the days of Tashriq afterwards. And then the mildly disliked fasts in the Hanafi school is to single out the fasting of a Friday. In the Hanafi school is considered to be disliked. Um, although if someone fasted, there's no harm, but to single out and say, I'm only going to fast on Fridays or, you know, I'm specifically going to fast on Fridays or uh, certain other days that happen to coincide, um, you know, with the celebrations of other faith uh, traditions, then it would be mildly disliked. It is also disliked to fast every single day, like fast for your entire life. Uh, so those, those are the seven types of fasts. Of course, uh, clearly the fasting of the month of Ramadan happens to be an obligation. And so we continue. As far as the intentions. Now there's, according to Islamic law, Sharia, there's two types of intentions. Um, the following three types of fasts do not require a specific, uh, do not require a specification. Uh, intention can be made any time from the previous night until Dahwa Kubra, right? Until Dahwa Kubra. And Dahwa Kubra is defined as the middle of the day, right? Um, Fat that, and those are uh, Ramadan fasts during the um, yes. Just wanted to make sure Ramadan fasts during the month. In other words, if you woke up after the time for suhoor uh, was over, and um, you had missed the time, you missed your suhoor, you missed your intention. You hadn't made the intention the night before when you went to sleep. As long as you make it any time before midday, um, your your niyyah, your intention is valid. So with Ramadan, there's there's definitely that. Uh, specified vows. In other words, if someone specified and said that, if so-and-so happens, I will fast next Tuesday specifically. So it's not like they have to make the intention the night before. We'll understand this and come back to this in a moment. You don't have to make the intention the night before as long as you woke up at Fajr time, during the time of Fajr, to pray your Fajr. Your fasting has already begun. And at that time, if you made the intention, that would be valid as well. And voluntary fasts, nafal fast. So if someone woke up, prayed their Fajr, did not have any water, did not have any tea, and around, you know, after sunrise, maybe an hour after sunrise, two, after, two hours after sunrise, decided and said, you know what? I'm just going to fast today, then that 
um, you know, you can you can go ahead and make the intention and continue your fast. So as long as you can make it during that time, uh, you know, even after Fajr, your intention, your fasting would be uh, valid. Dahwa Kubra is generally translated as midday. So the time between Fajr and Maghrib, you would divide that in half. As long as you made your intention before half day, you would be okay. So the point you want to take away here for all of us happens to be that the fasting of the month of Ramadan, we should, of course, try to make the intention before we go to sleep and say, I'm going to fast tomorrow. Or at the very least, you know, make the intention at the time of suhoor that I am, you know, going to fast today. Um, although, you know, some would argue and say that the suhoor in and of itself is almost like an intention. If you know what I'm saying, you have woken up for suhoor too fast. So that in and of itself is an intention already. So it's not like you have... The reason I say this is because certain masajid and you know certain of our institutions may end up sending you a calendar and it has this uh, phrase there that says, you know, intention for fasting. By the way, that's just an Arabic phrase that says that, you know, I intend to fast tomorrow for the day of Ramadan. I mean, that's, that's literally what it is. It's not a specific dua or prayer that you find anywhere. Really, the intention is in the heart. God forbid if someone slept through and ended up waking up, you know, at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning, didn't make their suhoor, somehow ended up missing their fajr prayer as well, <clears throat> as long as they wake up around 9 o'clock, um, they can make the intention at that time and continue their fast. Now, since we are talking about fasting, the intention being specific, uh, the following fasts require tabyit to make the intention at night. In other words, make the intention, and night means all the way until the time Fajr begins, right? Until Subah Sadiq. So you're required to have made the intention, either you can make the intention at night not wake up for suhoor and straight wake up for fajr, that would be okay. Or when you wake up for suhoor in the morning, you would make the intention at that time. But if the time for fajr has already entered, and then you make the intention at that time, that would not be valid. The following types of fasts require an intention and specification of type. Make ups, qada from Ramadan. So not only do you have to make the intention, and be but you have to be specific that this is the fast that I am doing. See, with Ramadan, the fasting of Ramadan, you don't have to be specific because you're only fasting for the month of Ramadan. But if, you're, if you missed a fast or two, let's just assume that maybe last year in Ramadan, you missed a fast or two, and you want to, though you're not required to, you want to make them up before this coming Ramadan. So when I, and assume that I want to make that fast up tomorrow, when I go to sleep tonight, I would have to intend specifically that I'm going to fast tomorrow. And it is this fast specifically is the makeup for that of Ramadan that I happen to have missed. I can make that intention before I go to sleep at night, or <clears throat> I can make that intention when I wake up for suhoor in the morning. So <coughs> the makeup, the qada of Ramadan, uh, the intention must be specific. A makeup of a voluntary fast. Remember, we categorized this fast as a wajib fast. So you made, you had a voluntary fast. You broke the voluntary fast. Now you're going to make up that fast. Again, tabyid, intention, being specific, uh, is required in this type of fast. So before you go to sleep at night, at night or when you wake up for suhoor, you have to be specific that today I am fasting for the fast that I broke, the voluntary fast that I broke, and I'm making that up. The fast of expiation, kafara, we'll come to this in a little while. If you are making up a fast of kafara, uh, if you're making a fast of kafara, then you have to be specific in your intention that this is a fast of kafara and it has to be done before subh sadiq. And unspecified vows, another mutlaq, right? If someone just intended and said that if so-and-so happens, I'm going to fast three days and you didn't specify which days you were going to fast. If that happens to be the case, then the night before, when, when we say night before, we mean subah sadiq, right? Before the time of fajr. What, you know, any time after maghrib, make the intention that the fast I'm going to do tomorrow is going to be one of the fasts, one of the three, for example, that I had vowed to do, and I'm going to make up that fast. So these are, that's what it comes down to. What is a kafara? Uh, we'll, we'll come to in a moment, we'll come to the things that break your fast. But what is a kafara? 
Uh, kafara literally is an expiation, okay? And the reason I'm mentioning kafara first is because there are reasons for which someone may need to make a kafara, may need to make an expiation. Uh, there's a long hadith that goes there, that goes behind this. Uh, a person came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and said, "Ya Rasulullah, I'm ruined." And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asked him and said, "What's wrong?" And he said, "Ya Rasulullah, I ended up uh, having relations with my spouse as a result of which I broke my obligatory fast." And so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, uh, "Free a slave." And so that's the first thing. If you, if anyone, did not fast an obligatory fast, despite having the ability to do so without a valid excuse, they must not only make up that fast, they must make a kafara as well. Or if someone began a fast and chose to break their fast without a valid excuse, a mature adult, naturally not a child, but chose to just randomly said, you know what? So two, two types of people specifically, right? Someone may say, I'm not going to fast in Ramadan. I don't fast in Ramadan. I don't care about whatever their reason may be, right? And they don't fast and they have no valid excuse. It's not like they're ill. They're not traveling. They're fully healthy and so on and so forth. So they've chosen to not fast or have chosen to break their fast. Not only do they have to make up that fast, which is a required fast, it is a fard, um, they have to do a kafara as well. And the kafara is uh, freeing a slave. So the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, free a slave. Now this sahabi says, Ya Rasulullah, there's no way I can free a slave. So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam said, you have to fast 60 days, 60 days consecutively. Six zero. 60 days consecutively. So much so that the ulama mentioned that if someone gets to day 59, and misses the last day, they have to start their fasts of kafara all over again and do all 60 days consecutively. And over the years, and, and the reason I share this is to give some hope. Over the years, I have come across many people who did not fast for years and later on in their life became uh, more devotional, more practicing and chose to you know, start fasting. Uh, not only did they make up all the fasts that they missed, 15, 20 years of fasting, five, 600 fasts. They didn't do it at one time. You know, they started with two days a week, right? One day a week, two days a week. In the course of one year, they were, you know, they got to about a hundred fasts. Between five and six years, they finished their five to 600 fasts. So there's a way to do it. Uh, and then, of course, did their kafara as well, the 60 days consecutively. So the Sahabi, he says, Ya Rasulullah, the Nabi alayhi says, fast 60 days consecutively. The Sahabi says, Ya Rasulullah, I can't fast for 60 days consecutively. Right? So then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, feed 60 poor people, two meals. Okay, so 120 meals. Feed 60 poor people. He says, Ya Rasulullah. I don't have the ability to do that either. Some of these Sahaba, they were beautiful. You know, there was such a blessing for all of us. So this, this man, just the Prophet ﷺ didn't respond to him. A little while later, the hadith mentions a man came with a basket of dates to the Prophet ﷺ. And, and the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says, Aina Sa'il, where's that person who was asking those questions about fasting? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm here, I'm here. So the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, take this date of baskets and distribute it amongst the poor in Medina. And so the Sahabi, the, the, the questioner responds and says, Ya Rasulullah, is there a family poorer than mine between these two hills? In other words, between in this valley of Medina. Is there... And so the narration mentions that the Prophet ﷺ had a humongous smile on his face and said, take it and feed your family. That was the mercy of the Nabi ﷺ. Though the lesson and the stipulation that we take away from this is um, if a person does not fast or, fa or or breaks an obligatory fast of the month of Ramadan, they need to make up that one fast and also do a kafara. A kafara is freeing a slave and a kafara is also 
uh, either freeing a slave. If you're unable to free a slave, naturally we may not be able to do that. We have to fast 60 days consecutively. And if we are unable to fast for 60 days consecutively, then we have to feed 60 poor people two meals. Or give one poor person two meals a day for 60 days. Now the ulama go on to mention that uh, if you're unable to do that, then give 60 poor people about three pounds of wheat or its value in cash or grains, right? Um, and then there's a few more things that you can go on here. But if, if someone is completely, you know, you're, you're unable to make up the 60 fasts, then you can feed uh, 60 people. Um, <clears throat> two meals, right? So essentially 120 meals need to be given now. Some, there's some ikhtilaf around this with amongst the ulama, whether you can give it to the same person or you can give it to them all at one time or so on and so forth. But, you know, I would urge you at this point, uh, you know, to speak to your local teacher, scholar, imam, uh, so that they can uh, come up with a, a solution uh, for you. Now, the reason we mentioned that first is because... Um, the mufsidat us Okay, we move on to the things that break one's fast. Um, the actions of one who is fasting are divided into four categories. In other words, if someone breaks their fast, it's divided into four categories. Number one, those that require a makeup as well as an expiation, a kafara. Okay. The second category is those that require a makeup but no expiation, no kafara. And then the third category is that they don't require anything. In other words, your fast remains intact uh, and, it, and is not disliked. And the fourth category is that those that require nothing yet happens to be, your actions happen to be uh, disliked. So just really quickly, we'll go through them. Um, those that require a makeup as well as an expiation. Okay, so we got to be very careful with this. And this is the fasts of Ramadan. Uh, if someone eats something, if someone drinks something, including medication. Okay, some people are sort of under this impression that you can take medication while fasting. That you can take a tablet, put it in your mouth, and swallow it. That will break your fast. Okay. Some people are under this impression that you can take a tablet and take a little teeny beanie bit of water, put it in your mouth and just take it down and your fast would still be intact. Absolutely not. Right. According to the vast majority of the ulama, anything that goes down your throat, even if it happens to be medication, breaks your fast. And in this specific case, not only does it break your fast, you're required to do a makeup as well as a kafara. If someone has intercourse with their spouse, then that will require um, a qada, makeup, as well as a kafara. And we've covered kafara. Now, if anyone does any of these actions forgetfully, then there is, they don't have to make up the fast, nor is there an expiation. So maybe on the first day of Ramadan, you still, you know, you still weren't in the habit of fasting and you, you know, drank some water or ate something. You came down into the kitchen and there was something, you know, on the dining table and you were hungry. You didn't realize why you were hungry. You just took a bite and you ate it. Not required to do anything. Okay. Forgetfulness. You're not required to do anything. Um, the, so that's the first category. You need to be very, very careful. Even, you know, a lot of times uh, when we gargle, you know, people when we gargle, that's why they say while you're fasting and you're gargling, you should be very careful. If water goes down your throat when you're gargling, right, that requires a makeup. Um, now, of course, that doesn't require a kafara. It only requires a makeup, but we need to be very careful. The second category, those that require a makeup without expiation, if someone needs to use a suppository, for example, because it's essentially going into your stomach, um, require, it breaks your fast, does not require a, a, a kafara. Um, accidentally swallowing water while rinsing the mouth. Uh, being coerced to break one's fast. Someone forces you somehow physically wants to abuse you or something and says, break your fast, then uh, it will break your fast. Uh, 
Um, um, and then, you know, a self-induced vomiting, self-induced vomiting will also break your fast, though the vast majority of the opinion are of the uh, uh, ulama of the opinion that if you vomit, it doesn't break your fast. There's an ikhtilaf around this, but if, if self-induced vomiting, it'll break your fast and uh, you'll just simply have to make up the, make up the fast over. Um, things that do not require things that don't so if you did the following actions they don't require anything and they're not disliked in other words if someone uh, gave blood although you know um as long as it doesn't weaken a person that would be okay using the miswak is okay rinsing the mouth or nose is okay uh, wearing wet clothes of, because of extreme heat all of that is okay does not break your fast now a very common question and i'm sure someone's going to ask this is it okay to brush your teeth while fasting um, yes, it is okay to brush your teeth while fasting. Uh, using the siwak, miswak, the tooth stick, is a sunnah. Uh, and if we can use that, uh, it would be nice. We'd fulfill a sunnah. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says, whosoever uses a siwak, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would allow them to say the shahada, would inspire them to say the shahada at the time of their passing. Uh, especially during Ramadan, get into the habit of using uh, the siwak. Uh, if we must uh, use a toothbrush and a toothpaste, try to do it before suh uh, do, Sorry, before fajr time, during your time of suhoor, so that you don't enter into your fasting. But if you happen to need to go to work or so on and so forth, and you must brush your teeth, it would be okay. It will not break your fast as long as that doesn't go down into your throat. Uh, it won't break your fast, and your fast will still be intact, though it's considered to be disliked because there's a certain taste to it that enters into uh, your mouth. Uh, those that require nothing yet are disliked. Um, if someone tastes food, you know, puts it at the edge of their tongue, of course you can't swallow it, you have to spit it back out. Or you have a small child and you, you take a little bit of food, you chew it and then give it to the child. Um, of course, not without a valid excuse, it would be wrong. If someone has an excuse, it's allowed and one uh, can uh, do so. So that's, and then if anyone has any specific questions, uh, we will come to that uh, in a little while. Um, and we're, we'll begin the Q&A in about 10 to 15 minutes. So again, this is a request to everyone. If anyone has any questions, feel free to share them with us. And we'll, we'll uh, you know, time, time allowing, we, we will try to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, I'm going to talk about suhoor in a moment specifically, but before we go there, people who are exempted from fasting in the month of Ramadan, uh, people who are ill are exempted from fasting. So uh, a diabetic individual who may not be able to stay hungry for so long, uh, a pregnant woman, uh, a woman who's nursing, for example. Um, these people, now of course, depending on your illness, uh, there are some people who will be ill and will be, able, will be able to make up their fasts sometime after Ramadan. And if you happen to be in a position, not out of laziness, laziness doesn't count, but if you happen to be in a position where you can make up your fasts anytime in your life before you pass away, fasts that you have missed, you are required to do so. You are required to do so. Right? Giving a fidya will not suffice. But if you happen to be a person who is ill, has an acute illness, and as a result of that, you will never be able to make up fasts. Then you will give a fidya. We'll come to that in a few moments as well. But with that said, a pregnant woman, a nursing woman, uh, whenever she is done with her pregnancy and finished with her nursing, she needs to make up those fasts. Uh, they do not have to be made up prior to the next Ramadan. So contrary to what many people will say, oh, uh, you know, I have to make up my fast um, before next Ramadan. No, you don't have to. It's preferable to do so. The sooner we get, we complete an act of ibad ibadah, an act of worship, you know, we that's a certain burden that is on our shoulders. As, as soon as we have relieved ourselves of that burden, then that would be good. Someone who is, you know, severe thirst, severe thirst, where they actually fear that they would faint. Not just thirsty because it's a hot day. You're supposed to feel a little parched. Okay. Uh, severe thirst, uh, exempt. Traveler is exempt. Um, playing sports, PE, physical education, training for 
um, you know, sports, these are not considered to be valid reasons for one to not fast. And if one chose to not fast in Ramadan for those reasons, then they will be in sin. Not only will they have to make up those fasts, they will have to give a kafara as well. Um, now, for individuals who are unable to fast, right, completely unable to fast, will never be able to uh, make up their fasting, uh, they have to give a fidya. Very old people, um, people who happen to be um, you know, young but have a medical condition, um, they have to give a half a saw of wheat for every single day. So essentially, 2.2 kilograms, three and a half pounds. Okay, three and a half pounds of wheat is uh, what should be given. Now, we won't go into detail, at least not now, but at some point, if you want to. Uh, one, uh, depending, uh, uh, based on the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one can give uh, dates as a fidya, barley as a fidya, raisins as a fidya, um, the, uh, you know, based on the price of dates, um, that will probably be the most expensive fidya, you know, up to $30, almost $30, $35 a day. If it's raisins, about $20 a day, depending on the price of raisins. Barley is a little more. Wheat is probably the cheapest, right? Wheat, flour, okay? And by the way, Three and a half pounds of flour or three and a half pounds of wheat that we give as a fidya, that is the same amount that we give as sadaqatul fitr. Okay, zakatul fitr, sadaqatul fitr, fitra, fitrana, whatever you call it. I'm going to come to that in a little while. It's the exact same amount, right? While many of your masjids may have signs that say five dollars and ten dollars or fifteen dollars, really, in all honesty, it's three and a half pounds of wheat. And very recently, as I was teaching Kitab al Som to our students here at the college, you know, I had them do a little bit of homework. I said, I want you to find out how much three and a half pounds of wheat is. And really, if you do now, of course, there's no harm in giving more. One should give more, but one should also know what the minimum, you know, required value is. Uh, a bag of non branded flour at Safeway, you know, five pound bag comes to a little over three dollars or a little under three dollars. So, which means three and a half. Pounds of wheat really comes to a little under two dollars, really. So your your fidya can literally be two dollars a day, okay? Uh, now, which is sixty dollars. But if someone decides and chooses to give a little more, so that the poor can benefit, of course, there's greater reward in uh, in doing so. Yeah, traveler, not required to fast, and so on and so forth. So we covered that as well. Um, I'm going to come to, uh, a, 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 we're gonna, I'm going to talk about two, a few more things, and then we'll open it up for questions, inshallah. Imam Ghazali, rahmatullahi alayhi, mentions there's a, a three grades of fasting. Right? He says one is the ordinary fast. The vast majority of people, we just do sort of an ordinary fast. Uh, we just refrain from eating and drinking and other activities and you know we just get through the day but you know our, our, our day just we just kind of get through it the the special uh fasting is uh, where he mentions six things he says see not what you're not supposed to see speak not what you're not supposed to speak hear not what you shouldn't be hearing do not what you shouldn't be doing Avoid overeating and look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with fear and hope, right? Khawf wa raja, anticipation, ya Allah, we fasted and Allah will accept it from us. But at the same time, a little bit of fear, is my fast accepted? Ya Allah, accept my fast, right? And then he goes on to mention and says that the extra special type of fasting is the fasting from the heart, from unworthy concerns and worldly thoughts, in total disregard of everything but Allah. Right? Absolutely nothing. You know, you're not in touch with the dunya. Right? There's nothing. Put everything away. And, and it's very interesting that, you know, many of us have probably seen and experienced ulama, pious predecessors. You know, and this is something that, uh, you know, we, we were seeing so 
little and little of in this day and age, where in reality, right, uh, I can tell you, you know, we spent time with many, many teachers. As soon as Ramadan entered, they were done. No, nothing of the dunya consumed them. All the matters of their dunya, whatever it is that they needed. In fact, preparations for Eid, preparations for things after Eid were done before Ramadan began. Right before Ramadan began. So when Ramadan came around, there were, now of course they didn't have any phones or laptops, but assuming that if they did, no phones, no laptops. It was ibadah, worship, dhikr, Quran, and that was all that, was all that consumed them. Yet at the same time, that may not be possible for us. But what is possible, brothers and sisters, is let's stay away from watching, you know, unnecessary, unnecessary scrolling on your phone before the time of iftar because we have nothing to do. All right? WhatsApp, uh, Facebook, Facebook videos, Instagram, Instagram feeds, right? That's just useless. You might as well spend that much time. So see not what we're not supposed to see. Do not hear not. Right? Avoid overeating, right? Things make your fast count. Make your fast count. Um, when now there's a few, you know, actions. When 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 Ramadan would begin, the Prophet والسلام, would make a special dua. He would congratulate the companions. So saying Ramadan Mubarak is fine, it's not a bid'ah. The Prophet والسلام, gave a welcoming sermon. So if someone decides to give a sermon and you know, remind each other uh, of the blessings of the month of Ramadan, then that's completely welcome. You describe the virtues of fasting, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in relation to Ramadan, my ummah has been given five things never granted to a previous nation. The smell from a fasting person's mouth is more beloved to Allah than the fragrance of musk. Right, the smell that, you know, that smell that comes out because of the hang hunger, that's more beloved to Allah than the fragrance of musk. Now, one can use the siwak during that time. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam continues, the fish in the sea keep seeking forgiveness from Allah for the fasting person until iftar. Allah decorates Jannah every day for this fasting person. The devils are chained up during the course of this month and the entire ummah is forgiven during the last night. Now, Suhoor, I want to talk about Suhoor, Iftar, and Sadaqatul Fitr. Hopefully we'll close after that. Suhoor is a blessed meal. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam reminds us and says, make Suhoor. The idea behind fasting is not that you, you know, put yourself in hardship. Okay, that's not, that's that, that's not the spirit of fasting. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam said, make, make the Saharu. Make suhoor. فَإِنَّ فِيهِ baraka. There's blessings in it. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ asked the Sahaba to delay their suhoor. Now, I want to clear, clarify one thing. Delaying suhoor does not mean make it five minutes before the time for fajr. Okay? Delaying suhoor means do it in the latter part of the night. That's the way the ulama have understood it. Okay, sometimes when we think delay suhoor, so let's use a time here. Let's say that the time for fajr begins at 4.45, and that's the time we're going to use okay, for, the, for the rest of the few, next few examples. 4.45 is when fajr begins, depending on the timetable or calendar that you use. Um, delaying suhoor does not mean make suhoor at 4.40. Delaying suhoor does not mean make suhoor at 4.43. Okay? Delaying suhoor means don't make it at midnight, don't make it at 1 a.m., don't make it at 2 a.m., make it at 4 o'clock, right? Closer to when you begin your fast so that that food and that energy remains with you for the course of the day. Now, also, eat healthy, right? I don't think I need to remind anyone of this. Um, you know, people, we sometimes jokingly say that, oh, I don't lose any weight in Ramadan. Why do we not lose weight in the month of Ramadan? Right? At least a little. Why do we not choose to eat healthy? Right? Let it, let it be a Ramadan in which we eat healthy. Let it be a Ramadan in which we do a little bit of exercise. Let it be a Ramadan in which we are slightly conscious of what we are putting into ourselves. Because that is also important. Part of one's perfection of Islam is to be conscious of what we are consuming. 
Not just going to the local halal meat store and as long as we find out it's halal and no. Right? Halal and tayyib. We're not talking about meats here, but we're talking about healthy foods. We're talking about how much we put into ourselves, you know. Now, there is a major misconception and problem that we see in our community. And this is based on a hadith. There's a hadith, and I'm going to share this hadith. The Nabi alayhi salatu was salam is narrated to have said, if one of you hears, pay attention to this. If one of you hears the call to prayer while their drinking vessel is in their hand, let him not place it down until having fulfilled their need from it. Mustadrak Abu Dawood, Imam Ahmad, all of these uh, narrators mention this hadith in their collections. Though, one thing we need to understand here, the call to prayer in this hadith of the Nabi alayhi and, and So practically what happens as a result of this? We're making suhoor at the masjid. Saturday night, last 10 nights of Ramadan, right? And we are eating our olives and cream cheese and honey and pita bread, I don't know, whatever it is that people eat or drink. And then the adhan begins for fajr. The adhan for fajr. Allah. And what happens? We immediately take this glass of water. So while the mu'adhan is saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, hayya ala salah, hayya ala al-falah, we're still drinking water. Okay. 4.45. I'm going to come back to 4.45. Though the explanation of this hadith clearly mentions, moreover, what is meant by the call to prayer in the hadith is that of Bila in this specific hadith. If the adhan is going, the vessel is in your hand, finish drinking. Okay. What is understood is in is the hadith in the hadith is the adhan of Bilal radiallahu anhu, which used to be given well before true dawn. So as to alert people that dawn was approaching, it does not refer to the call of prayer at dawn, the call of prayer at Fajr, which used to be performed by Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Brothers and sisters, this hadith specifically refers to an adhan that was called before the adhan for fajr as to alert people that the time for suhoor is almost ending. Not the adhan at the time of fajr. Okay. Very gr grossly misunderstood by Muslims, especially in the West and especially in the United States of America. You go to your average, average masjid for Fajr prayer, the adhan for Fajr is happening and people are still drinking. Reality is that this was a call to prayer before the call to prayer. Now let me explain this to you. Some of you, and for those of you that may have been raised in the West, may want to ask your parents. I have spent a Ramadan or two in my ancestral village where my parents come from. What used to happen back in the day, and I've experienced both, Back in the day, the jami', the large masjid in the village, they used to have this big metal bar or was it a metal bell. And about five to seven minutes before the adhan for fajr, ding, 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 really large bell. That was an indicator. You, you got just a few minutes left, get done. Later on, as technology evolved, they put this really large siren up there. It would just go, ooh, and it would just make this really, ooh, and that was an indicator your time for suhoor is ending. Make it quick. Because the adhan for fajr will happen. Now let me take you back just a little bit. Fasting begins at true dawn. Fasting begins at true dawn. True dawn, we said, began at 4.45. Which means that that is the cut off. That's where the fasting begins. So how is it that during that time when Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah, where it's 4:46 now, you're still drinking water. Have you not entered into the time of fasting already? How can you say your fasting is valid? Now, madama madha, whatever has happened for us in the past has happened 
But going forward, if we, have to, if we happen to have the habit of doing this, then we should be conscious and not do this. I also want to share generally, just this is not from fiqh per se, but the, 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 the practice of our pious predecessors, the ulama, is that they would stop eating 15, 20 minutes before the time for Fajr. Now, I know that may be a little extreme for some people, considering some people may wake up 10 minutes before you know, the time for Fajr comes in. But, you know, especially in the United States of America, when we have the, the two times, uh, you know, the, the two different criteria for the beginning of the time of, for Fajr, uh, you know, there's the 15 degree, and I don't want to get into this, the 15 degree and the 18 degree, you know, whatever you follow for the course of the entire year is what you follow. I'm not saying one is better than the other, one is right over the other, no, whatever, whatever your local masjid does is what we should follow. But there's the 15 degree and the 18 degree. The 15 degree is by which most of us go by um, in the United States of America, which is the, uh, you know, the, the, the most accepted uh, time. The 50, so if we were to use the 15 degree and assume that Suhoor was at 445, the 18 degree, the 18 degree time comes in about 15 to 17 minutes earlier. So that would come in at 430, for example. The 18, that, that would be the difference between the 18 and the 15 degree. Though the vast majority of the ulama that we find, those that are very conscious, cognizant, um, they, they, may not, they may not want to make it difficult for people. They will allow them to uh, begin their fasting at the 15 degree timetable at 445. But their own personal habit, if we spend time with our teachers, we will find that their own personal habit is that of um, ending their eating at the 18 degree timetable just to be on the safe side. And then, so for example, at about 4.30, and then use the 15 minutes after that to make the hajjud in qiyam. But with their food part, they would want to take, play it extra safe, as we may call it. Now, that's not what I'm advocating today. That's not what Zaytuna is advocating. I'm just sharing this with you. So when we have that, the practice of our ulama who stop eating at 4.25, 4.30, and then we have people that are still continuing to drink after the Adhan for Fajr begins. At four, so that's, that's an extreme. So we need to find some sort of a middle ground as a general habit that if 4.45, the time for suhoor is ending, uh, then by 4.40 is a general habit. You know, have that last bowl of cereal or, or your final paratha or hummus or, you know, your final drink of water and, and brush your teeth. Just we, we want to do it as perfectly as possible. That's, that's all we want. There's no, the, the, in, the, the desire is not to make it difficult on anyone. The desire is so that we fulfill our ibadah completely, perfectly. We don't want to. We want to get it done, you know, and then be able to continue. So that's one thing I, I wanted to cover. Um, and then iftar. We'll do iftar and sadaqat al-fitr. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ made iftar immediately after sunset. So he, as long as we make sure that the sun has set, make iftar after that. The sunnah was to do iftar. Um, the Prophet ﷺ made iftar before Maghrib, by the way. So sunset, iftar, iftar with either dates, if dates were available, dates, if not, water, and then, you know, prayed his Maghrib after that. You know, we find certain people sort of kind of an extreme where no, Maghrib is an obligation. I'm going to pray my Maghrib first and then I'm going to break my fast. No, we break our fast. Break it with dates. Break it with whatever you're comfortable with. Break it with water. Break it with whatever national uh, food or drink uh, is prevalent in your community, in your culture. Uh, share it with those around you, right? Share it with those around you. The Prophet also made iftar with milk. So uh, for those of us whose families come from the Indian subcontinent, uh, that pink milk that we drink is probably, uh, will also fulfill the sunnah, inshallah. Um, although that milk in and of itself has become very politically heated uh, these days. But khair, um, but we also find, so make, make iftar after sunset first, then pray maghrib, and then you can come back and enjoy your dinner. Once again, do not overeat. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam made iftar with poor people, right, with the poor in the community. Um, one of the things um, that is really important and very practical, um, I have seen this my entire life. And of course, this is a practice that, you know, continues with our pious predecessors. 
the time for iftar, the time before iftar, the 15, 20 minutes before iftar, the elders would remain engaged in dua. If that meant that your food was slightly cold, you know, you can put it in the oven, whatever it may be. But the time for the time before iftar was time for dua. I have not spent so generally as a habit. Um, I, 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 you know, it's personal. I just share it with you really quickly. I have not seen any of my um, elders, my parents, grandparents, or any of my teachers go to anyone's house for iftar ever. Ever, period, ever. At most, they would make their iftar at home and go to the masjid or make their iftar at the masjid. And the reason behind that was they would always say that the dua at the time of iftar is one of the most opportune moments of the day and is not to be wasted. And so every single day for 10 to 15 minutes before maghrib, in fact, 10-15 is less. These are people who would spend a half an hour, right? The lights would be dim, they would quiet, raise their hand. Every day at iftar for 15, 20 minutes, they would be engaged in dua. Now, it may or may not be possible for us. A lot of us are working from home these days. Iftar is pretty late these days, 8.30 for us here in California. So we're usually wrapped up with work and so on and so forth. So for at least, brothers and sisters, I almost want to beg you, five, seven minutes before Maghrib, get everyone to sit down and individually raise your hands and be engaged in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. And similarly, the time of tahajjud in the morning. You know, at times, going back to suhoor, I'm sorry. Going back to the suhoor that we have. You know, uh, we, the time for suhoor is a time of dua, it's a time of tahajjud. Yet, we're still finishing eating. In an ideal world, we would have completed, you know, again, we've I've seen my teachers and my elders, that their suhoor would end a half an hour before suhoor. They would carry, they would finish eating whatever they wanted to eat brush their teeth, make wudu, and then for 15 minutes, 17 minutes, 20 minutes, they would make some tahajjud, two rak'ahs, four rak'ahs, and then raise their hands in dua. Opportune moment, opportune time to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then maybe about, you know, whenever was their time for their suhoor, they would take that sip of water, two sips of water, just so that the last thing they can get in is a little bit of water so that they wouldn't be parched during the day and begin their fast. Yet, now alhamdulillah, the pandemic in that sense has been a blessing slightly that we're not going to people's homes for iftar, but it seems like that may continue this Ramadan a little bit, at least with families. Uh, the time for iftar is not for dressing up. The time for iftar is not for looking for parking outside someone's house. The time for iftar is not for, salam alaikum, how are you? Is That time is an opportune time to make dua. Now then people may ask and say, Oh, but the, the, the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says there's great rewards in, in helping people make iftar. And sponsor iftars. Sponsor an iftar at your local masjid. Find a school of, filled with orphans where you can sponsor an iftar. Find relatives back home and send money so that they could use your money. Or I'm not saying back home, anywhere, wherever you may be. Find relatives, you can give money to them. Uh, send them money so that they can buy the supplies for iftar, right? Let them allow, allow them to buy your rice and grains and oil and whatever with your money so that when they cook, you get the reward of their iftar and their dinner, right? Um, subhanallah, over the years, I've come across now three people, right? There's a, there's a brother who came to me last year and said that, uh, you know, this this brother spent an exuberant amount of money because, you know, he got all his friends and their addresses, found a company that sells dates in Southern California, and literally sent almost 200 boxes of dates to family and friends. Right now, he has the financial ability to do so. There's one, there's one family, subhanAllah, may Allah bless and reward them, and we say, MashaAllah, right? The, this one family is you know, single-handedly responsible for buying... Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes of dates for about 10 of the largest masajid in the community that they live in. We're talking about five to seven boxes a day at 10 different mosques. 
right? One family that is responsible for doing so. So there's ways. I'm not, and I'm not saying you had to buy hundreds of boxes of dates. You could put dates in a Ziploc bag and share it with someone, share it with a family, share it with a relative, and get the reward of their um, fasting, right? Uh, I came across a friend who was saying that, you know, this year they found an opportunity to um, find dates uh, or get dates from Medina to be mailed out. And so while the person is living here in California, the person decided to send out dates to their family, you know, abroad. Uh, and said that I want my family abroad to benefit. So there's, there's many ways where we can feed those that are fasting rather than wasting time. And you can party. People say Ramadan is about family and get-togethers. It's not about get-togethers. Ramadan is about you and God, you and Allah. After Ramadan, you can party, make merry, do whatever you want. Lastly, yeah, so iftar parties. I'm not, I'm not an iftar party fan in case you can't tell already. Uh, two things, and I will close, inshallah, and I promise. Sadaqatul fitr. Now, this generally falls under the category of zakah, but we'll cover it quickly here. Uh, is mandatory on every Muslim, as long as you own the nisab, right? As long as you... Unlike the zakah, where you have to be above the nisab for a year, and then you're obligated to pay zakah. Uh, in the case of sadaqatul fitr, the charity that we give at Eid or before Eid, as long as you have the nisab, whether you have it for a year or not, you might have become the owner of nisab that fine morning. Uh, you have to give sadaqatul fitr. It is mandatory on behalf of oneself, one's child who is a minor, um, and you know the family. So basically, you know, if you have wealth, you're responsible for yourself and everyone that you are. Uh, looking after. How much is that? That is again a half a saw of wheat, right? Half a saw of wheat, so three and a half pounds of wheat flour, or one saw, seven pounds of dates, raisins, or barley, right? Seven pounds of dates, raisins, or barley. And again, so we're, we're, we're reminded to give it before Salatul Eid. If you give it slightly before Eid, it is acceptable. Uh, some ulama mentioned that if you give it up to a few days before Eid, it is acceptable. Some go on to mention that if you give it up to 15 days before Eid, it is acceptable. And some go on to mention that if you give it at the beginning of Ramadan, it's acceptable as well. And the, the idea behind, we shouldn't wait until the last minute to give Sadaqatul Fitr. We should try to give it in advance, at least a few days. And the, the, the spirit of Sadaqat al-Fitr is so that the entire community may enjoy Eid. So if we've taken our Sadaqat al-Fitr and given it to a poor and needy family in advance, they may be able to buy new clothes, they may be able to buy new shoes, they may be able to you know, uh, buy food supplies so that they are able to celebrate Eid as well. That's the whole spirit behind Eid. I know that some masajid, including ours here in the Bay Area, we... Whatever zakatul fitr, sadaqatul fitr, fitra, fitrana, whatever you call it, whatever it is that we collect before, um, you know, before Eid, we actually try very hard to distribute it amongst the poor and needy families in the community before Eid. In fact, we start making calls from the masjid office on the 20, and I, I recommend for wherever you are for your masjids to do this as well. On the twenty, you know, on the twenty seventh of Ramadan, twenty eighth of Ramadan, we have a we have a you know ongoing list. We call those families, and we tell them, you know, to come at a specific time, and we make sure that we distribute that money well beforehand. Certain masajid like to hang on institutions, nonprofits, masajid hang on to people sadaqatul fitr for days, weeks, months after Eid. That's not the spirit. That's not the spirit. The spirit is so that it should be given before Eid to the poor and needy families so your families can benefit from it. I know, I know an imam in the Bay Area uh, who was telling me once that, you know, on the morning of Eid, he says, I put a few thousand dollars in my pocket from the Sadaqat al-Fitr money that we have collected at the masjid if we haven't already distributed it. And at the day of Eid, at Eid, when I come up, because when people come to greet me, I know many, much of my community. And so when I come across members in my community who happen to be needy, I quietly reach into my pocket and take out a bill or two 
of a hundred dollars and quietly put it in their hand so that their children, they can also afford to eat the good food that everyone else is eating. And if they are want to go out that night for dinner with their family and enjoy, they can do that. Or if they haven't been able to buy certain gifts or things for their children, they are able to do that and do it with dignity. That, brothers and sisters, is the spirit behind uh, Sadaqat al-Fitr. Now, last thing, and I promise this will be the last thing. Salat al-Taraweeh is a sunnah of the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam. It is the ijma' of the ummah that Salat al-Taraweeh is 20 rak'ahs. Um, now, the specific time to pray Taraweeh is the month of Ramadan. We don't pray Taraweeh before Ramadan or after Ramadan. It's in Ramadan. So my recommendation to everyone, myself included, is let us stop arguing about how many rak'ahs it is and let us show up at our local masjid and pray as much taraweeh as we can. That's it. Because once Ramadan is over, we're not going to be able to pray. Some people like to specifically make it an X amount of, you know, a number of rak'ahs and will not pray one more, one less, won't, won't pray two more, won't pray two less. There's no, you know, let's... And, 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 you know, kind of look at others condescendingly. Or you're wrong and you're wrong. That's not the spirit of Ramadan. The spirit of Ramadan. The Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says, if you pray Salatul Isha in congregation, you get the reward of worshipping Allah half of the night. Show up to the masjid for Salatul Isha. Pray congregational prayer. Pray Salatul Isha, right? At the masjid in congregation. If there's taraweeh afterwards at your local masjid, Pray as much as you can. If at any point you're a little tired and you desire to leave and go home, so be it. It's not an obligatory prayer to begin with. But if you're going to leave, and this, this, is, this is a practical request from an imam who leads taraweeh or led taraweeh for many years. When you're leaving, leave quietly. Get into your cars and go home. I don't want to hear your noises in the lobby and I don't want to hear your noises in the masjid parking lot. Right, we have time. We 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 can stand outside in the lobby of the masjid. We can stand outside in the parking lot and talk to people for hours. Maybe not hours, but tens of minutes. Yet praying two or four rak'ahs becomes so difficult for us. Keep in mind, there's a season for everything. Right, it's you can only avail of it in that season. Once that season is gone, that fruit is gone. Right, that fruit is gone. So you know how sometimes, and of course, now mashallah, we're living in an age where you can almost get any fruit in any season. But clearly, you know, with with certain seasons, and the you know those fruits are you know cherries, for example, in California, or strawberries in California. You know, sometimes, um, you know, I'll speak for myself. There's days when you know I'll get a really nice box of really sweet cherries. I'll skip dinner for a box of cherries because I can only have cherries during cherry season now i can have i may be able to have it later it won't taste the same the texture won't be the same say and sometimes i'll have a little more than i can fill because they're just so good and i can only have them then after that i'm not going to be able to get them right so similarly ramadan it's a time it's only happens in ramadan so let's make it happen and last but not least at least pray salat al-fajr and salat al-isha in the masjid and then i'tikaf in Ramadan, secluding ourselves, last 10 nights, recommended, sunnah of the Nabi alayhi salatu was salam. And the last 10 nights is when we just go, you know, max, just the final run, the final push. Just go all out, put everything away and make that happen for us. If we are able to um, make i'tikaf in the month of Ramadan, then we should do so. Now, zakah is sometimes a big part of uh, the month of Ramadan, but inshallah, we will come back. We will meet again one week from today, for those of you that may be interested, and go through the, fa the, the fiqh of, um, of um, zakah, inshallah. With that said, um, I will move on to the questions, inshallah. It doesn't seem like there's a lot unless someone chooses to... Um, the people that are behind uh, the scenes, if you have, if we've received any questions and you want, you would like to populate the file that I have, please feel free uh, to do so, inshallah. Oh.
Okay, alhamdulillah. Uh, beautiful question. How can someone with a very busy schedule prioritize worship during Ramadan? Um, that would be, you know, every individual would need to figure out what they, they have to do, what they don't have to do. And with whatever time you, of course, you'll remember that which is obligatory generally during the day are two things. Salah and Psalm. Ritual prayer and fasting. So make sure that you get your, with all your busyness, get your prayers in on time and make sure that you fast. Make sure that you get your prayers perfectly to the best of your ability so that you can derive maximum benefit. And similarly, fasting, don't do anything during your fast that would decrease the blessing of your fast. That's it. Everything else happens to be voluntary. Important, but voluntary. So as long, if you're extremely busy, you're not able to do anything, but you are able to pray on time, inshallah, and fast, alhamdulillah, you have benefited from the month of Ramadan. As far as reciting the Qur'an, we recite Qur'an in Salah. Surah Fatiha, is that not Qur'an? Surah Falaq, is that not Qur'an? Surah Nas, is that not Qur'an? You may be so tired that you're like, okay, a long day at work and someone, you know, for you to pick up a mushaf and to recite is, makes it even more difficult. You just want to rest. Maybe you're just lying down on the couch. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. Is that not dhikr of Allah? If all you know is, for example, Surah Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Just recite it over and over and over and over again. Is that not recitation of the Qur'an? So Allah knows our intentions. Uh, if a person has bleeding gums in the morning, will that invalidate their fast? Bleeding gums do not invalidate one's fast. Can one fast according to the Fajr and Maghrib prayer times in Makkah? Particularly if they are from a northern climate where fast can be 17 plus hours. Uh, this is a question best suited for the Muslim communities that are living in those communities, right? So they are in the extreme north um, uh, uh, areas, uh, you know, people are still fasting. Some are fasting 20, 22 hours. Uh, generally, you should check with the ulama there and see what the community is doing there. Um, now, as far as fasting with Makkah and Medina, generally what we read in the books of fiqh is not the timings of Makkah and Medina per se. The timings of the countries uh, or the areas closest to you where Muslims are fasting and they are able, you know, they fast from a certain time to a certain time. So you wouldn't follow Makkah per se, because there's no ruling anywhere that says you go by Makkah time. You would generally go by the closest time, a few hours away from where you are living to get adequate time of fasting generally. But we still find there are humongous communities out there that are fasting for 20 hours a day. And they get through it because, you know, the, in that case, then the weather is not so extreme. Uh, and it's possible for them, you know, because sometimes you could be fasting for 12 hours, but it's extreme heat it becomes very difficult. So in those, you know, with those um, areas that where the weather is not so extreme. So you will find people who are fasting for 20, 20 plus hours and not so difficult. Is it allowed to miss a fast in order to get the COVID vaccine? So first and foremost, the COVID vaccine will not invalidate your fast. Similarly, if you're getting a meningitis vaccine, inshallah, because if you're planning to go for Hajj, for example, during the month of Ramadan, for whatever reason, that will not invalidate your fast. Um, are you allowed to miss a fast? So generally, we have found ulama mention and the teachers mention that one should still fast um, the day they're getting their vaccine. Um, if after they come back, they're feeling very weak, they're feeling weak, they should still try to continue their fast. But if they're feeling so weak that they need to take medication, then it would be valid for them to break their fast. And also if they're really weak the next day, because it seems that the side effects are the day after and not the day of. So what we are hearing, myself included, uh, experienced that, uh, you know, the side effects are generally the next day and not the day of. Uh, but if someone feels extremely strong about not being able to get through that day without water or without, um, you know, medication, then uh, sure, that would be okay. Then that would be considered to be an illness. How can a new mom 
whose child wakes her up at night, plan her worship during Ramadan, especially praying on Laylatul Qadr? Beautiful question. It's not about how much you pray, it's about the intention. Let's not forget, you, mother or parent, looking after your child and waking up to look after them is also an ibadah and worship, is it not? Is Really, people don't think about this. Are going to work, when I go to work in the morning and come back in the evening tired, that I consider that to be an act of ibadah and worship. That's halal rizq through which I am feeding my family. That's, that's, an, that's an act of ibadah in and of itself. Now, of course, if, you're, if you've become a workaholic so that you can make a lot more and become a millionaire, you know, that may not fall within ibadah per se, but, you know, just working enough to be able to feed your family and be comfortable, that's ibadah. So if you're waking up in the middle of the night uh, because your child is waking you up, you can make dhikr while you're uh, feeding your child, for example. Subhanallah, 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 alhamdulillah, 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 Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. You can do all of these. That's ibadah. And then after that, you go back to sleep. If, if you... Uh, can make wudu and pray two rak'ahs really quickly, then you can do so. You don't have to. If you feel that by making wudu and praying two rak'ahs, you're going to wake up and not be able to fall asleep after that, then don't. You can go right back to sleep and wake up uh, in the morning. So the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam, you know, obligatory. You've prayed your fajr. You've prayed your isha at night. You've prayed your fajr in the morning. Inshallah, we get the reward of the entire night of Qadr. Allah knows our situation. Allah knows our situation. At what, what age should children be encouraged to fast? Again, different families, different scenarios. You know, I know people, I know families where you have, you know, five-year-old children that are fasting for four hours or half-day fasts. Uh, I know families where children by the age of seven and eight are maybe fasting two, three days during the month of Ramadan, maybe more, you know, on the weekends, not on the weekdays, maybe if they have to go to school. Um, I know families where there's children who by the time they're 10 and 11 have fasted for most of the month of Ramadan. So really just depends on your child, their ability, uh, you know, but we're reminded the Nabi alayhi salatu wasalam says that you, you know, rec you remind a child to pray by the time they're seven years old, right? So at least get them into the habit of fasting, half day fasts, weekend fasts, uh, celebrate it, enjoy it, um, and then you know, continue with encouraging them to fast by the time they get nine to nine, ten uh, on the on the weekends. But keep in mind that you know, young children these days are hitting puberty much earlier than ever before. You know, we find we find young children by the time they're eleven, twelve, they have hit puberty, uh, and if they've hit puberty, then they're required to fast the entire month of Ramadan. So the sooner we start, the better it is. Is is one's fast valid if they make the intention to fast? and begin the fast in the state of major ritual impurity? Absolutely. Very good question. So if one, uh, you know, entered in the state, into the state of uh, janaba, major impurity, major ritual impurity at night, um, had a wet dream, um, had a, uh, you know, had intercourse with their spouse, fell asleep, uh, woke up, and... Um, in fact, missed suhoor maybe, maybe even missed fajr. And it's eight o'clock in the morning, but oh my God, you wake up and you realize you're in a state of impurity. You haven't prayed fajr, you haven't made suhoor. Your fast is still intact and valid. Okay. Which means that you don't, although it's preferable for one to get a shower in before the time for fajr enters. But if someone got up, so you get up. There's 12 minutes left, for example, for fajr to come in. And... You have two options, suhoor or shower. You should make your suhoor first. And then you can jump into the shower. Even if that shower begins into the time of fajr, your fast would still be valid. Should one fast if they have an orthodontist appointment for adjusting their braces? I had braces a very, very, very long time ago. So I don't even know what that entails anymore. Um... If during that appointment, uh, you know, there's something that's going to go down your throat, then maybe not. If it's uh, a doubt, then you should fast and take your chances 
And if as a result of that, maybe later on something does go down your throat, at least maintain the fast and maintain not eating for the rest of the day, but make up that fast later on. So again, uh, you know, again, these are very... If, if the fast is broken, if one's menstruation period begins, is the fast broken if one's menses begins regardless of the time of day? Yes. So if someone began their period 10 minutes before Maghrib, you know, fasted the entire day, and then all of a sudden, right before Maghrib, they felt that their period began, that fast is invalid. Does watching a movie and mistakenly viewing an obscene scene vitiate the fast? You shouldn't be watching any movies in Ramadan to begin with. Um, but to answer your question, no, it does not break your fast. Right? It does not. But again, then that falls into the category of seeing not what we should not see. Go for a walk. If you're really bored, go for a walk. Buy a bike. Go for a bike ride. Now, I'm not saying be extreme, but let's utilize our time uh, better. Do anger, cursing, and backbiting break one's fast? They do not literally break one's fast, but the barakah, the reward, is taken away. Right, the reward. You don't. You don't. Your your benefit is not maximized. Does a traveler shorten prayer during Ramadan? Yes, Ramadan or not. If you're a traveler, you will shorten. You can shorten your prayer. Should they perform tarawih? They can if they want to. Right? They can if they don't have to, but they can if they, if you have time. Uh, you know, again, Ramadan. It's almost like saying, you know, going back to that example of cherries. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, you know. You, could, you only have time to do it in Ramadan. Might as well. Do, <laughs> do diabetic people completely avoid eating sweets? Okay, you know your diabetes is but a, a good bowl of kheer or shir khurma or kunafa or a nice, you know, mango from back home comes your way. You know, depending on your diabetes, are you, are you, are you, you know what you would say? It's just a few bites, or I'll have an extra pill. Right? I'm assuming that some diabetic people do this, right? You're not going to give up the opportunity, right? You have, you'll have a few bites. I'm not saying you should, by the way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that. So when, so when we do it, when it comes to food or certain other things, why not? When it comes to ibadah and worship, should one wait for the entire adhan to finish before breaking their fast or rush to break their fast? There's no rushing to break their fast. You don't have to wait for the adhan to finish. You can immediately break your fast. If you follow the 18 degree time for fasting, should you pray Fajr at that time to or wait until the 15 degree adhan? Technically, if you follow the 18 degree timing, for uh, your suhoor, then you can pray immediately after. Though what I have seen, and I'll, I'll speak for myself here really quickly, I generally follow the 15 degree time for Salat al-Fajr. But I do make it a habit to use the 18 degree time to make my suhoor. But because I generally follow the 15 degree time for my uh, Fajr, I do wait until the 15 degree time to pray my Salat al-Fajr. Can you please offer advice for someone who wants to recite Quran in Ramadan but does not know proper tajweed? Recite the Quran. Recite the Quran. Allah is all loving. Allah is all kind. I'll share an example. Uh, how many questions do we have? Okay, we just have three more, so we'll be done after that. Please do not add any more to that. Um, my ancestral village, there was, and there still happens to be a time, if you walk in the streets of the village after Salatul Fajr, you will find the men folk sitting outside their homes reciting Quran loudly. And the women folk are inside reciting their Quran and they have their tea with them and they sip tea and they recite Quran. Now, of course, we were students and you know, took our first two tajweed classes. And by the time we got to the third class, we thought we were masters in tajweed. Right? We learned about lahan khafi and lahan jali, the minor mistakes and the major mistakes. And we thought we were masters of tajweed, know it all. So we went to our sheikh, we went to our teacher and we said, Sheikh, all these old people 
Look at the way they recite Quran. Absolutely zero tajweed. Right? They're making lahan jali after lahan jali. They're going to go to hell. You know, typical. And he would smile and he would look at us and he says, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Right? The love and dedication with which they recite the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would oversee their faults. Right? Not a single day would go by where they wouldn't recite two, three Jews of the Quran. These were people who were known to have finished the Quran, you know, once a month, twice a month, three times a month. You would go to these people, you'd ask them in the course of the year, how much Quran you have you recited? They would say 12, 15, 20, 50, 60. My wife's grandfather, if you asked him how many Qur'ans have you recited, he would tell you that this Ramadan I recited 30 Qur'ans. My own grandfather, you would go to him, ask him how many Qur'ans have you recited, he would say 20, 25. Right? These were people who would recite and recite and recite. They would just be with the book of Allah. So with that said, the point I'm trying to make and to answer the question, if you don't know proper tajweed, it's okay. Learn. I'm not saying don't learn tajweed. That's not what I'm saying. Endeavor to learn when you have time, but that should not stop you from reciting the Quran. How can we keep ourselves motivated to worship whilst having de deadlines that consume our time in Ramadan? Try to finish those deadlines before Ramadan so that you don't have to do them in Ramadan. If you have to do them in Ramadan, strike a balance between the two. In Ramadan, as you're working, make a dua to Allah in your difficult moment and say, Ya Allah, give me a job where I don't have to work so hard during the month of Ramadan. Allah listens. The problem is that we've taken all of this for granted and said, this is my life. No. There's a dua in the hadith. Allahumma ftahli abwaaba rahmatik wa sahilli abwaaba rizqik. Oh Allah, open the doors of your mercy for me and make easy for me the doors of your sustenance. In other words, there's a specific dua we find in the hadith to ask Allah for an easy job. Right? And so as our, one of our teachers would remind us and say, you know, if Allah, you know, the sunnah of Allah is that you work and you make an income. But he says, if you're asking Allah, you might as well ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, grant me my risk without having to work. Grant me my risk and let me work, but let it be meaningful work where I can serve the needy and help people and not, not have to worry about getting paid for it because I have a means of sustenance coming from somewhere. You might as well, if you, with Allah, you might as well go, go big or go home. That's, that's how you do it with Allah. You might as well go big or you go home. Right? That's, that's Allah. He listens to everything. Did the Prophet wasallam accept invitations to break fast outside of his home during Ramadan? I am not aware of this. Aren't there rewards associated with accepting invitations during Ramadan or at other times? I didn't say, no. Accepting invitations is different. What we find in the words of the hadith is to feed someone to their fill. So you can cook and have it delivered to their house. You get what I'm saying? Uh, now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't have people over. It's the time wastage that comes with it that bugs me. That time for iftar is not coming back. Right, that time for iftar is not coming back, and we have a habit at home. We've seen this from something that's lasted in our families, close friends and family. You know, a day or two before they get a text message or a call and says, "On Saturday, don't cook. We will be bringing iftar." And trust me, you know, I do this every year, once every, you know, every week or every ten days. You know, I'm I have all these bags with me that I put, you know, put in my car and I'm literally the delivery man. Not with the kids being a little older, they take care of it. But still, we become the delivery. We're like going to this Muslim neighbor's house, this Muslim family's house, that friend's house and making deliveries, like extensive deliveries, everything from entire watermelons, right? But the time of iftar is to spend. Now again, this is what I've seen. I'm not saying you have to do this. But the concept of accepting the invitation is not found anywhere. The concept of feeding is found in whatever way. Now again, you can go to people's house for iftar. As long as in your car ride, you're reciting Quran, you're not wasting time. The time before iftar, there's no guftagu. There's no conversations. It's guftagu with Allah, conversation with Allah. 
that immediately after iftar, the food is being served. You know, the vast majority of people, people who are able to come for Isha on time during the weekdays cannot make it on time on the weekends. While on the weekdays they're at work and on the weekends they're not at work. But on, on weekdays at iftar, they're home. And on the weekends at iftar, they're at an iftar party. And the iftar party, the host decides what time to serve the food. How does one, one rinse the mouth and nose during the ritual shower while fasting? Just put it in, but don't be extreme. Put it into your nostril so it goes up to here. Put it in your mouth. You don't have to gargle. You just put it in your mouth and spit it out. Brothers and sisters, uh, may Allah reward you all for being with us on this journey. Some of you may have caught it live. May Allah bless and reward you. For those, some of you may actually catch a recorded version. May Allah bless and reward you. From all of us here at Zaytuna College in Berkeley, California, Jazakumullahu Khairan, Ramadan Mubarak to all of you and your families. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.